sodium and chloride, plain old table salt, what you saw as halite in mineral labs, is the main component of salinity of the ocean. So if I look at what's happening out there, I've got two main things that are making planet Earth work for us. One is I'm moving uh, heat around planet Earth by moving water around in the oceans. And two, I've got heat being moved around planet Earth by winds in the atmosphere. So why do I need to move heat around planet Earth? <coughs> well, just because Earth is a sphere, it doesn't heat very evenly. Let's think in terms of a sunbeam coming in from the right. And all the sunbeams are coming in parallel. So everything just comes in from the right and hits the Earth. Well, as you might guess, at the equator, it's a little closer, so it's going to be a little warmer. But that's not the big thing. If you look at it, one square meter of solar beam is hitting the surface of planet Earth dead on. And it's basically hitting one square meter of Earth. But look what happens when that one square meter of solar beam comes in toward the poles. Look at the curvature of Earth and look at the resulting area that that one square meter of solar beam now has to affect, has to warm up. It's not going to be as effective, is it? It's got way more area to cover. So the net effect is it's going to be a lot hotter at the equator where that solar beam just has a square meter to warm up. And it's going to be a lot colder at the poles where that square meter of solar beam has to warm up a much larger portion of Earth because of the curvature of the sphere. Uneven heating. If I just left it this way, I didn't worry about redistributing this heat around planet Earth. The water would literally be boiling at the equator. The oceans would be boiling and evaporating away faster than the water could replace it. And at the same time, the water at the poles down to about Kalamazoo would be frozen solid. We would have that kind of a temperature gradient from equator to pole. That's going to make it really hard to sustain life on Earth, isn't it? Boiling at the equator, frozen at the poles. We maybe have a strip of just a little bit in between that might be habitable without having extremophiles like bacteria that love boiling water. But life isn't going to develop. And sustaining life isn't going to work if you're talking about trying to grow crops and you know <coughs> money and gather. So we've got to move this heat around the planet. And this is where the ocean really plays a big role. It works in conjunction with the atmosphere. They work in much the same way. And it's kind of hard to tell which one's really kicking it off. What's the chicken? What's the egg? They're kind of back and forth feeding <coughs> off of each other. But here's how it kind of works. In the ocean, we see the circulation pattern developing. Notice here's North America, South America. Here's Europe and Africa. So I'm kind of looking up at the equator a little bit. So this is the North Atlantic, and this is the South Atlantic, essentially. And notice I've got this big circulation pattern going on. In the North Atlantic, I've got the circulation pattern where the water's moving around in a clockwise pattern. And in the South Atlantic, in the Southern Hemisphere, I've got a similar circulation pattern, but now the water's moving in the opposite direction. It's moving counterclockwise. Why is it doing this? First of all, why is it moving in a circular pattern at all? And second of all, why is it clockwise in the north and counterclockwise in the south? What's going on here? I can
can see this when I take a satellite photo of the planet. This is what's so cool about satellite technology. Here I've got a picture of the temperatures on the oceans of the Earth. And this picture was basically combined over a period of about seven days, seven to eight days. Now, if I tried to do this by mapping the temperatures of the world's ocean, oceans using sailing ships a century ago, how long do you think it would take me to get enough measurements to build a map? Millions of years. Uh, literally hundreds. Millions of years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have to give a double check here. <laughs> but yeah, and you're going to talk about not getting a snapshot of what's going on, but you're going to have this mixed bag of apples and oranges and grapefruits because it took so long to make the things that when you finally got the last measurement, the first one didn't mean anything. It was long gone. But now with satellites, we can get a snapshot. We can make picture of what's really going on on Earth. And here you can see the different temperatures of the ocean. Blues are cold, oranges, reds, hottest, greens kind of in between. And look at the pattern you see. This is cool. Obviously, it's hot at the equator, it's cold at the poles. Well, there's no surprise there. But look what's happening here. Look at this cold water along the southern part of the, uh, the uh, uh, southern uh, hemisphere. And here it is, hits South America and is deflected back out towards the equator. <coughs> Same thing's going on over here and with Africa. Look at what's happening here with the cold water up around Alaska. It's coming down and being deflected along the west coast of the U.S. And you can see the hot water being moved up. You can see it going there in the Gulf Stream along the east coast of the U.S. And you can see these circular patterns, and you can see that both in the North Atlantic and North Pacific, these are moving clockwise. Whereas in the South Pacific, in the South Atlantic, in the Indian Ocean, they're all moving counterclockwise. And you can see this pattern. So it's real. I'm not making it up. So why is it doing that? Well, remember we're on a sphere. And that sphere is rotating about its axis. And that's where it all kind of comes in. With uneven heating, if I've got hot at the equator and cold at the pole, I want to move things north and south, don't I? But my wind comes in westerly. So I've got a bunch of different forces doing different things. And the planet turns around on its axis. So here's what we're seeing. It's a process called Coriolis effect. And you're going to see the same thing when we talk about the atmosphere. So you want to kind of get this down. Coriolis effect is kind of cool. How many of you have heard of Coriolis effect? Okay, a few. This is one of those things that, you know, just drives you crazy. If I am at the equator and Quito, the capital Ecuador, is right on the equator, you can stand in the downtown street one leg can be in the northern hemisphere, and one leg can be in the southern hemisphere. Straddle the equator, right on the equator. And keto, therefore, means it is on the fattest diameter of the planet. <coughs> it's right there at the equator. And yet, it's got one day, 24 hours, to make it all the way around in one rotation, right? Now, if I go up to Buffalo, Buffalo is on a much smaller disk, if you think in terms of cutting through the planet. It doesn't have as far to travel, does it? It needs to get all the way around the Earth in one 24-hour day, but it doesn't have as far to go. If I'm down here at Keto, and I calculate that distance it has to travel, 
and keto, it's got to go through basically uh, about is only about 783 miles an hour and we're talking significantly different distances of travel and 783 miles an hour versus 1036 miles an hour. Now, hopefully you kind of picked up on the problem here. Buffalo and Keto are on the same planet they're rotating about the axis, but they're moving at two different speeds. Doesn't that kind of intuitively just drive you crazy? How can they be on the same planet and move at different speeds? But it's simply because of different diameters of the disk. So if you look at it, let's look down on the North Pole. This is the path Keto would be going across on the blue. Here would be the path the buffalo would be going on the yellow. Now that it boards with all of that. Here's how it creates a problem for circulation. Let's say I'm at keto, and for some reason keto and buffalo really just can't see eye to eye and they're gonna go to war. And keto pulls out their cannon and they get ready to fire their buffalo. And they fire, and the cannonball takes off toward the buffalo, and kind of seems to veer off to the right, and splashes down in the Atlantic Ocean. And the people in Buffalo are just laughing like crazy. It's like, oh, those keto people can't even shoot straight. So they drag out their cannon to fire back, and they don't do any better. Their cannonball veers off to the right and splashes off in the Pacific. What just happened? Are they just bad shots? No, it's the rotation of the Earth under the projectile, isn't it? Before Keto ever started <coughs> to fire their cannon, it was sitting on the ground with the shell in the cannon, and the cannon was rotating along and it was moving at 1,036 miles an hour eastward, wasn't it? That's the rotation of Earth. So before they ever sent that projectile going northward, it was already moving eastward at over 1,000 miles an hour. Then when they fired it, it kind of becomes disconnected from the land. And as it moves northward, what's happening to the relationship of the speed of the projectile moving over the land and the rotation of the land itself. Buffalo's only moving at 783 miles an hour, isn't it? So because the diameter is getting smaller as we head northward, the relative positioning of the shell versus the land, the shell's moving eastward faster than the land under it, and the shell then apparently is drifting eastward. It's getting ahead of Earth, and it lands out here in the Pacific. They didn't account for the changing diameter of Earth on its way north. Likewise, when they shot back southward, now Earth is the one moving faster. It's getting ahead of the projectile that's only moving east 783 miles an hour, so now the shell is lagging behind, the earth is rotating out from under it at a faster rate, the more it goes south, and we get the same effect. As I go north, I see a curve that's clockwise. As I fire south, I see a curve that is clockwise. So if I were to put them together, I've got this clockwise rotation going on in the northern hemisphere. Anybody see this? Okay, so it's the rotation of the Earth problem. So why is it rotating counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere? Yeah. 
Yeah, because your view has changed, hasn't it? It's not from the South Pole, but what you've done is standing at the equator, you've turned around 180 degrees to look southward, haven't you? And that changes the relationship. So either way, you can play the scenario. You're going to get rotation in the northern hemisphere that moves that moves clockwise in the southern hemisphere that moves counterclockwise. Just like that. So if you have a sink and you watch the water go down your sink, and it's a spherical sink. So nothing's putting any extra influence on it. In the northern hemisphere, the water will go down the sink clockwise. In the southern hemisphere, it will go down the sink counterclockwise. Now, obviously, that very seldom happens because shapes change on sinks and there are a whole bunch of other factors that come in. But if it were purely a, a spherical shaped sink, that's the effect of that. So if I go back and look at what's going on in the North Atlantic, the circulation pattern there is what we call a gyre. All of these circulation patterns now are gyres. It's bounded by a series of continents. And I have four legs to this gyre. I can split it up into four components. And this is where we start to tie it into what's happening in the atmosphere. In the south leg of the gyre, everything's moving westward. By the time it gets over here to the southwest part of the Atlantic, it's going to be forced to start moving northward. We've got some of those pesky continents in the way. And things are happening with Coriolis and winds and all that. Finally, it's cutting across the Atlantic, heading for <coughs> England, and it keeps swinging down and becomes part of the current coming down along the east side of the Atlantic past Europe and Africa. So each of these legs now has a different influence working on it. But the net effect is it's taking warm water down here in the equator and moving it up toward the poles, and it's taking cold polar water and bringing it down to the equator. <coughs> That's kind of the main key here. And if we look at all these gyres now uh, throughout the planet, we've got our big gyre in the North Atlantic, which breaks up into another gyre up here in the north. We've got our big gyre here in the Pacific, both of them clockwise. We've got our big gyre in the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Ocean all run counterclockwise. But we have one more big current that we have to worry about, and it changes the whole picture. These gyres, five gyres, are all bounded by continents, and they're, they're all kind of self-contained, I guess is the kind of way you think of it. But look what's happening here along Antarctica. Antarctica is kind of the bottom of the globe, isn't it? And now we've got a current that's running just right along the coast of Antarctica, right along the globe. This one isn't self-contained, is it? All of these are just working on a portion of the globe. Now I've got a current that's going all the way around the globe. It's going to have a much different effect. This is what we call the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. <coughs> Sometimes it's called the West Wind Drift because it's fueled by the West Wind. And it just feeds on itself. The wind from the West pushes it along and it just comes back around. And the wind's always coming out of the West and it's just pushing this current. So you can imagine that everything that happens down along this current is going to be pretty intense. That's where things are really building up. That's where the really bad weather is. By the 40th parallel, kind of right in this area,